Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, this is our second lecture of our Distinguished Visually Artist Lecture Series. Um, I want to say thank you for the Center for uh, Humanities and Digital Research for co-sponsoring this lecture tonight. Um, I am thrilled to introduce to you Jezebeth Roman Gonzalez, who I've had the immense pleasure of watching their practice develop since their early graduate studies. Jezebeth has won prestigious awards, including one of the four deadliest fellowship awards in 2020, uh, one of the four out of the entire graduating MFA student body in the country, to give you some context of the prestigious of the award. Uh, Jezebeth has participated in national and international residencies such as Acre in Steuben, Wisconsin, Venus Center for the Contemporary Arts in Omaha, Nebraska, Banff Center for the Arts and Creativity, Queer Ecology in Banff, Canada, Irante in Puerto Rico, and is currently an iLab artist in resident at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. Go birds. Go birds. <laughs> Jezebeth has exhibited in several solo and cur curated national and international programs such as Document the 15 in Castle, Germany, Space in Portland, Maine, Modern Contemporary in Jersey City, New Jersey, Ping Yao International Photography Festival in Ping Yao, China, among several others. Uh, if you would please join me in welcoming Jezebeth Roca Gonzalez. Hello, can, can you guys hear me? <clears throat> awesome. Uh, first of all, I, my voice is kind of uh, right now, so I might take some breaks just to <clears throat> recover. Um, but uh, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you, Bobby. Uh, Brooks, thank you for having me in your class. Uh, critiquing, it was so much fun. And also I wanna say thank you to my cousins for coming to visit because this is the first time that I have my family in any of my lectures and this is like a really big deal for me. Um, oh no, there we go. Uh, anyways, uh, yeah, so thank you everyone. Um, like, Bo oh, go birds. <laughs> like Bobby said, I'm uh, Jessabe and um, this is, these are some, maybe not all, of the people that I have collaborated with in the past. Uh, I'm, I mean, it's been so long now. I think it's like almost like 10 years of art making. I don't even know. Um, and this is like a, some images of my immediate family. Um, I am a, trained as a traditional uh, large format photographer. And for anyone that doesn't know what large format is, it's kind of like this old school film camera where you basically have to prepare your scene before you even photograph. So you really have to take a really long time in order to make one image. The box of large format film brings probably 10 to 11 images. And like, that's all you have to work with. So really mistakes and failure are kind of um, not that great, but obviously that's how we learn. Um, this project is called Remedio Casero, and the phrase Remedio Casero translates to home remedy. When I started this project, I was really interested in my role as like an art maker and then just kind of like in relationship to my family, but I think through the development of it within the years, it really was about the nostalgia of like not being home. My family is all based in Puerto Rico with some diaspora in like Florida, Philly, maybe New York. Um, I'm not really sure. Um, and so it was a very hard transition for me to um, move to the US by myself and just kind of like not have that. And through making the uh, portraits and like working in photography, I felt like it it helped us like kind of work in, through our relationship. I don't know if anyone has just like left their family, but like it creates like a giant void and like a giant gap. And you go from like interacting with people on the everyday to just like not really having an existing relationship. And I was really, really uh, kind of like craving that. Um, this is my grandmother, um, Abuela Luisa. This is my paternal grandmother. 
And um, this is my best friend, Bonnie, and she would visit Puerto Rico with me, too. Um, Abuelo Cesar um, and my sister and my nephew, uh, Jacobo, I really became interested in kind of um, portraying my family in these like kind of like high art ways because I just always felt like the subject matter in a lot of like uh, photo history, it was either very like colonial as in like people are going to other countries making images of different people and then bringing them back and being like, oh, like look at these people, they're so different, they're so weird. And then I thought like, oh, why don't I just work like with my family since we have like such a bond. And then through making that, I also learned that I was kind of re repeating those like colonial like languages. And so I just, um, it was like a true struggle of whether like showing my family and this like picturesque kind of um, imaging and then like the history of photography and like the colonial legacy of like imposing a lens into a group of people and then showing them to a different group of people. Um, I was really inspired by La Toya Fre uh, Ruby Fraser. Uh, she is a photographer that was, I mean, I, don't, I think she's based in Chicago right now, but she was based in Pittsburgh. And she has this amazing book called The Notion of Family, which, um, sorry, is this, um, ah, sorry, it kind of moved. <laughs> Um, she has this amazing book called The Notion of Family, which is uh, years of recording her family in relationship to the environmental racism that in Pittsburgh, the steel mills, and like basically the decomposing of like her mother, her grandmother, and all of these people that she loved. And I think she started photographing when she was 16. So, I mean, I really love just like the, not like the commitment, but just like the ongoing work of like the documentation, the working with family, which like honestly sometimes like I really want to be with my families and, and sometimes I just like need so much space and sort of like those dynamics uh, through time and how they change. This is a very beautiful image. I mean, I think there's a, there's a photograph in that book where she is at her grandmother's funeral um, and they just like photograph the casket and everything. Um, as I left a uh, grad school or like, I mean, undergrad and like probably in between like undergrad and like grad school, I didn't really have access to like a large format camera. They're really expensive. And I'm like, oh no, what am I gonna do now? And I did have a digital camera. And so I started working with a digital camera photographing. And um, I also got like an external flash. And so I just, committed to this project called Entre Tu y Yo, Between You and I, I told them about us. And it's basically about um, this like tight relationship between like me and the subject, but also like allowing the viewer in. Like my family is kind of like open for everyone, right, through photography. And that can be like an okay thing. And that can be not a great thing. And that can mean that a lot of people think that they know us and like there's so many layers and complexities to family that um, I just felt like the immediateness, uh, kind of like the sharpness of the um, flash and just being able to be very flexible in photographing, right? Like digital, a digital camera is almost like your phone, like you're like shot after shot after shot versus composing a scene. Then honestly, sometimes it would take me hours because photographing a child is not easy. Photographing my grandparents who have things to do is not easy. And I would pose them and pose them and they would just move and I'd be like, God, we are going to be here forever. And so like digital just like allowed me to be a little bit more flexible and more, more playful. And I think at some point I was like anti-digital. I was like, ah, oh, it's not real photo. And then I was like, whatever, that was bullshit. Why did I say that? Why did I think that? Um, and then it also allowed me to photograph things in a way that I was like seeing them. Like this is my grandmother's, uh, my paternal grandmother's uh, kitchen. Like I see, if you can see like this like red lighter thing, fluid, it has been there for years. Like I remember this like as a child and I was really interested in like being raised in this place that like through time, like hasn't really changed at all. And like these plates, for some reason, year after year are always there. And I don't know, I just like kind of like developed this relationship with this space and just being like, oh, like 
this is the space that kind of like is like my cosmo and this is the the space that has really kind of like layered me and made me a, like I don't know the person that I am and there are just so many gestures within like my grandmother and my grandpa and like this space raised like my dad and then like us and now my nibblings like my nephews and nieces I mean those are so many generations and things are just still like very static and I think like you know I mean that's like a privilege and I like at the same time it's just like a relationship that I don't really have with anything else and I think about like just not having this and I I, I feel like I'm going to collapse as a person we'll we'll deal with that when it happens also with digital photography I can just like make so many shots the I think the flash makes the images feel kind of invasive but I photograph my family in a way that like they they decide when they're going to be photographed and that I, just, I don't just like stick a camera in front of them I'm like say cheese you know um because it's like a working relationship so I see them as almost like my co-workers as in like if they want to be photographed and if they're okay I'll do it and if they're like stop it I'm like we're done, we're done for the day. And there's like a lot of negotiations of like when and who to photograph, power, what is done with the images and like just like a constant back and forth of communication of everything that happens. Like I see myself more of like an editor of like they're kind of like more of like the work creators. This is my mom as she was like dealing with cancer and this is like my nephew and my sister. And I just really like that like the digital imaging um, allows for like a lot of personality. I don't know if it's just a flash, but it's just, it gives it like a huh, like pump. Um, I was also looking, when I was an undergrad, I was looking at other people that were undergrads at the same time because I was being shown a lot of work of people that I was like, oh, I can never like photograph like this person or at least not at this stage. And so I started looking at other undergrad photo programs and then one of them was like SVA and Vivian Fu was a student at the time. And I just really love how playful she was with her images and like how photography can be very grandiose and at the same time, it can just be like a toy. You know, it's a very easy to manipulate and it could have a lot of different realms. And so like this is Vivian Fu's work. She does a lot of self-portraiture. She photographs her family. She photographs her food and just like a lot of like silly things that I was like, oh, I want, you know, just because I'm photographing my family doesn't mean that I can't go in like that realm or like, I don't know, try like different um, like aesthetics and whatnot. Oh, well, sorry. Are there kids? <laughs> Um, so after undergrad, I go to USF, which is in Tampa, and in part, one of my decisions to going to USF is that I'm thinking, like, Tampa is so close to Puerto Rico, I'm going to be able to go all of the time, like, this is going to be great for our practice, and it's just going to be so fruitful. Literally get to Tampa, and, like, within the month, Hurricane Maria hits, and then I have no access to my family. I didn't talk to my sister for at least six days after. I was like working my print lab job and I just get this call and it's like, you know, like entrecortado, like you can't really hear, it's kind of busy, there's people in the background and I'm like, what the heck is going on? Um, and so within like looking to still work with my family, at the time my brother was stationed in uh, Camp Pendleton in San Diego, or like Oceanside, California, which weirdly enough, I lived there for three years recently, just so odd. Um, and within our project, you know, we, we are the only ones that are communicating at the time. So our communication is like Facebook, text messages, Facebook messages, like um, any sort of like messaging app. And then he started telling me about his day. I'm telling him about my day. And we obviously is very militant. He's in the military. He's a Marine. And we started talking about this like military legacy within our family and just kind of the histories of like Puerto Rican people in relationship to the military, uh, ideas of citizenship, the scouting of students in schools, um, and just kind of like all of these relationships. And then at the same time, you know, trying to keep a bond when like 
basically the earth is like like everything is like a meltdown in Puerto Rico like um it was just like such a disaster and this was just like kind of like a way of coping I I think my grandparents didn't have like a working phone for like a year you know it's just it's it was wild um and so within working together my brother starts making images um that use either a phone or I send him um, disposable cameras in the mail. And we start collaborating in these ways. And then through time, I start making images in response. But I honestly feel like my brother was so much more of like, he was like such a better photographer than I was. And like, I kind of took a step back and again became this editor of like grouping things together and like making some decisions, but like, uh, photo wise, I felt like he just had it and like I didn't really need to be a full part of it. Social political things are happening at the time, being in grad school, going through um, like a major catastrophe, like this is really big. I couldn't really fully process this work at the time. And then we just kind of like took a break and I didn't, um, I didn't really work on this project for many years and then I had out of nowhere a curator contact me um, and she was uh, at C CCS Bard Angelica Arbaez and you know she was like really interested in showing the work and I was like I don't know this project has been sitting there on the shelf for so many years I'm like really scared because like also something is, uh, everyone has like an opinion of the military, but not everyone has an informed opinion about Puerto Rican people or Puerto Rican men in the military through like all of these like sort of like colonial structures. What does that mean? And I, I feel like they're like, it's like a more complicated, different layered narratives. And I just didn't really want um, to put a project that was so personal under like a flat realm that really didn't, fit like what we were exploring because like at the same time we're still kind of communicating as siblings and just like I don't know like keeping each other's back you know like being like okay like did you hear from anyone today like it, it, it's just kind of like a lot to to work with and so even before Angelica um had approached me other people had approached me and I just like I was like no I'm I don't want my work to be a part of this because I don't really think that we're understanding like the scope of like what this project is this isn't just like a relationship with someone that's in the military this is like a, a lot more than that especially due to the time that it was uh, made and so her and I really worked on this um, this is a mock-up of what the piece was for the exhibition and we really worked on kind of like layering and collaging and we went through like 300 images to just select the single image uh, 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 these couple images and i i felt like um you know like she really put a, the amount of, like labor and time that i felt like i don't know was needed for this work and then she like kind of motivated me to continue working on it and so it has like kind of off the shelf been put back on out in the world and it has been shown maybe like two times since like 2021 2022 um so of course as time keeps going um i start shifting my practice with my family in different ways but also as a reaction to um i mean i don't know if you guys remember anything about Hurricane Maria, but like, I remember Trump throwing paper towels at people that were in need, and I was angry, like livid for a long time. I feel like um, in Puerto Rico, I was saying like, te cortan y no sangra. You know, like you get cut and like you won't bleed because you're so angry. Um, and my sister at the time, she was, uh, she was in ag agriculture, she's a farm worker, and like her and her husband work in like a Platano, plantain, plantain uh, farm. And she didn't have a job basically for like a really long time. And just like think about like a family that has like a child and they just like don't work because 
of everything that's going on. And I, I don't know, I just had like a lot, I had a lot of feelings. I had a lot of feelings about people telling me to like get over it. I had a lot of feelings about, um, you know, everything that happened through that time. And like even post that time, like sometimes if we're, like I think if a hurricane's announced, like my family goes to like to, through so much like PTSD. And so like, and, and I'm sure you guys can relate like Florida. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I was really mad and then I took and adopted these uh, platanos from uh, where she was working and some of them were actually from my abuelo Cesar's uh, backyard and I was just kind of like hey I'm going to grow these for you as in form of like solidarity so that like your labor is like not like invalid or anything because like you basically feed an island and more. You work under the sun every day, but I mean, obviously they're, they're not like systematically taken care of. Um, they're really easy to dispose. And I mean, there's a lot to talk about that, you know, like at the time, like a lot of things like people saying that Puerto Rico was better without Puerto Ricans, that like not enough people had died, like just like so many insensitive things that I was just kind of like, I can't like, it's just like a finding a way to cope around things. And so I started going these platanos, they're my babies. Um, and I had to put this like mesh around them because the squirrels at USF like kept eating them. And I was like, no way, they did not come here for you to eat them. And I also kept them in containers and I didn't want them to touch like American soil. Cause I felt like they were kind of a representation of like my relationship with my sister and like just kind of like her labor. And I was like, F this place <laughs> in a way. I mean, again, I was very angry. And so that within time, within like a couple of years turned into my MFA thesis work. And like, honestly, my MFA thesis work was not going to be this at all. I was, I, I was going somewhere else, but I, like, you know, I didn't want to put these plants in a museum either, but eventually I was just like, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to work with this. And so as we're working in like a more collaborative way, we're like working with soil, we're working with plants, I am able to go back home and like record. And so the work is just kind of really representative of like everything that's happening at the time still through our relationship. And it just kind of goes into a lot of like different um, sociopolitical threads. So this is called uh, Desde la Sala Se ve la Isla, from the living room, you see the island. And it's just kind of an ode to like all of the grandparents' houses, um, anywhere where you can see like this eternal sunset. So the lights for me were just kind of like this, like perfect, like, um, I mean, you guys have like amazing sunsets here too. So it's just like perfect, like beautiful hue of like purples and pink with the grow lights, um, just kind of like shining on this like, um, flora that hasn't been touching like the US soil, and then a video called House Tour, which I made um, with my family, and I'm going to show you guys right now. This is also pacha, which is a passion fruit, and there are seeds that I had collected from my family's yard too. So I'm just gonna show you really quick. Sorry, just like the videos won't embed. So this is the video that plays as part of this, uh, this um, installation and it just loops. So this video uses an appropriated audio from a, um, 
I don't know, like YouTube, like lifestyle blogger, one of those like content creators. And basically what they're doing is um, teaching people how to move to Puerto Rico. And it's a very long video. I've examined it like for years now. And they're basically doing a house tour in like a really affluent neighborhood in San Juan. And the parallels is just like showing my grandparents kind of dilapidated, very used, obviously very lived in uh, house. But also one of the most interesting parts of this video for me in the audio is when she says at night, it's going to be all dark. Like the presence of the people that are here are not going to be seen. And like, he's like, oh yeah, how great. And you know, there are housing crisis everywhere, but there's a very specific like Airbnb housing um, crisis in Puerto Rico. And like, I mean, in, in general, because of like post hurricane trying to like revitalize the economy and then just kind of like selling, you know, some people selling out of like the, you know, some people sold cause you know, past the hurricane, they're like, we don't want to live here anymore. And then some people are just like really making so much bank. And it's just kind of this like dichotomy between like my grandparents, living room and just like this conversation and as, as well I think a lot of people when they think about Puerto Rico they think about San Juan but I'm more interested in what's called like La Isla which is like the other side of the island which gets like a wave like a back wave of everything and don't have the same not, I'm not going to say, say like representation but they're not in like the visual mainstream of those who are affected which usually they're just like as equally as affected. Um, some of the books that I was working and like reading, which I mentioned today at Brick's class, is The Cultural Politics of Emotion. Sarah Ahmed has this book where she really like encourages us to like feel, you know, like through like history and whatnot, like the people that have been allowed to not capitalize, but like really use like the power of feelings are like men in power politicians and then any other kind of like marginalized group is kind of put in a corner as in like too many feelings that's too bad and you have to you know do all of this invisible labor in order to be seen as equal or anything you know when it comes to like your work and so like the cultural politics of emotion really helped me deal with like yeah my feelings at the time and poetics relation of Edouard Glissant um, who's like a French po uh, poet and philosopher. And he really talks about like these displaced groups and how there's this like cultural nomadism where they're always searching for a place to belong in, but you never find it until you're back home. And that really uh, uh, struck me. Um, another work that I wanted to show that I was um, looking at was Sofia Galiza and Lluvia con Nieve. This is one of the best most amazing videos I've ever seen in my life. Sofia Galiza, she's an amazing uh, friend and artist. And I think I have it, uh, uh -uh. oh no. Um, I have it right here because I didn't want it to um, show any ads. And I have some text with it too, because sorry, I did not memorize it. But in 1955, Paramount News projected around the United States images of a plane landing in Puerto Rico carrying two tons of snow and a family from New Hampshire and the thousands of young people that received them in a baseball field. Um, the, uh, sorry, the piece visualizes the ideological production process behind these images, manipulating the last cinematic vestige of this moment through editing, because I think there's actually only like 13 or like 20 seconds left of this video. And then she just kind of looped it and made it into like a 13 minute video, which um, house tour is like a loop of like a, a one minute video. And even though it's one minute, it took me like an entire year to make. So this is really, really hard. Um, and then she says, the confrontation with these images is like an apparition in which each frame confirms the occurrence and expands its implications. Um, I'm just gonna play it, it's, it's, I'm just gonna play a little bit. Wait, let me make sure the audio is blasting.
Um, I really, really love this work. And I just really also am interested in kind of like the things that happen in Puerto Rico in relationship to the U.S. that only Puerto Ricans experience because I think there's like a lot of like um, projection of knowledge of the island, but I feel like the island is like an entity of its own and like no one really knows unless you have like sort of a connection to it, you know? Um, yeah, so I, I, I thought this work was amazing and I also thought just like the manipulation of something that's historic that's only like... 30 seconds long and just making it into this like film. Um, I was also, of course, uh, Ana Mendieta working uh, with her Siluetas and like Soyo Works and just sort of like her relationship to her home. She's like, in, uh, she was in exile, uh, Cuban exile and sort of like her return to Cuba and then like how she, she start working with Soyo and like these like materials that are just kind of like, like non-archival um i i think that there's just like such an amazing relationship to your work when you know that it's going to be destroyed and like after you make it you know there's no there's there's definitely no um secureness to it and like that's something that i like to work on with too because that's how i feel about this like back and forth between like the us and puerto rico and then just like in my relationships in in general um, I attended this amazing residency. It's called Bema Center for Contemporary Arts. I think everyone should apply. Ask your professors how to apply for residencies. Residencies are an amazing place where you can just go in with like no idea and like experiment on so many things. And then also you can go in with like a project and be able to accomplish that and so much more. Um, and this residency was probably one of the best residencies I've ever done. It was in the middle of nowhere in Omaha, Nebraska. Well, it's in the middle of the city, but you know, it, it was just, I was kind of scared of like what was going to happen there. And I had gone in like 2020, but then because of the panorama pandemic, um, I didn't really get to go in like a year or two years later and like my plans had completely changed so I had to like revisit my materials and everything and this is my um this is a card reja or portón on a terrazzo tile terrazzo and it has belonged to my aunt titi chiqui and tio javier for like 30 years and it just has been sitting outside but also because of like different things that have been happening in the island like earthquakes the tiles had started to pop from the floor and I don't know if you guys know about terrazzo, but that thing is like packed in there. If you ever try to take a tile out, you're going to break the entire floor. And so I think about just like this thing that has been like a part of a home and seen so much and like now it's just like starting to pass. And, and so they like send it to me in the mail, which is just like, imagine like a mailman carrying this. It's so heavy. It's made out of concrete. Um, and so I just started like carving into it like different scenes and kind of like working more with familiar scenes and like images from like my home in order to kind of, I don't know, get back into it. Cause like making art was really hard during the panorama. Um, and then I, I worked on this video, Vortex, which I will show now. Sorry about that back and forth. I'll put the audio down. Thank you. 
first question you ask someone who is considering moving to What is your lifestyle? Our people are very welcoming and very friendly. And I think that's the number one reason they stay. We're going to pause that. All right, excellent. So the thing about um, Vortex is um, it still uses the same appropriated audio, right? Like I said, I worked with this uh, work for a long time. But some of the things that like are verbally that are like talked about this is like kind of blaming the people on the island for like this like mass like and terrain of like Jewish and whatnot, like the displacement, like, oh, well, we're just too sweet. Our salsa is too great, or like, this is whatever. And I mean, there is like a historical connection to just kind of, you know, Christopher Columbus and like talking about like the invasion of like the Caribbean and being like, the Tainos had a sweet tongue and then therefore, you know, how could we not? You know, they were so nice. There's like always like this kind of like repetition of histories and words um, throughout time. And then another thing that I think is really interesting is like, once you get here, you just won't leave. And like, I mean, that is like the case for a lot of people that were like enslaved, you know? And so we have all of these like vocabularies and all of these words are used in such a way. And I'm just like, oh my God, like we're going through these like waves of like what some people would call like settler colonialism and like whatnot, but like this is like a repetition of like a very historical um, things which is, with like different faces and like different modes and like more contemporary ways. Um, and so like I spend my time at Bemis like working on this like video installation and like just like working on um, other projects that kind of, I don't know, just kind of still dealt with this like family narrative like every day, like the boring banal, my grandparents making uh, dinner and that, like a power outage and using like this like um, novella uh, candle and um, just like my nephew playing and just kind of these scenes to, just showing these like scenes of everyday life with like this conversation that I feel like it's so heavy but it's such a casual conversation as well because it's like such a casual topic. Um, after Bemis, um, I worked in, uh, I went to the residency of Banff Canada. Again, another great residency, apply for residencies. They're so amazing. And in Banff Canada, I started working in like a short film called Isla Flotante, Floating Island. And my approach to this work is very, very different because this starts with like a lot of text and a lot of like, kind of like just like ideas that are on paper specifically and then moving and selectively curating um, images. So, oh, here we go. There's so much you guys, but I'll scroll through this really quick. It's gonna be kind of, kind of boring. Um, so like events that really, I, I wanted to share the text just to give some context, because if not, it's, it's still like a work in progress and it's kind of like fiction based. So I feel like um, we're still kind of getting there. Um, events that uh, weave through this work or like uh, are a part of this work is January 2020, I travel home, Puerto Rico from Tampa uh, to celebrate the Three Kings Day with my family. And that night there was 
a huge earthquake. And after that, there are many earthquakes that destroyed a lot of houses and just kind of like, there's like a lot of structural damage um, in the island. And then it just connected so many other art, like, or other moments through like, just like life and like art life and whatnot. I met someone at the Acre residency. Her name is Jova and she's a curator at the museum in, De in Detroit. Um, and she talked about her mom was, uh, had written uh, about how the Caribbean is not gonna survive global warming. And I have really been thinking about just like the island and this like climate catastrophe. Um, and then my nephew Liam was born when uh, that uh, subterranean volcano exploded. Um, I think it was like in Tanzania. Um, and I was just like, oh my God, like you were brought to this planet with the forces of nature. Um, the tours that we did and like different like moments that uh, are just kind of related to like the forming of an island. And one of them is um, in a studio visit, uh, I like talked about, or I was encouraged to write a eulogy and I did a Google uh, search of like, what happens to a volcanic island in proximity to tectonic plates? And it says, over time, the island is carried away by the underlying tectonic plates and the plume pops out another island. Over millions of years, this geological hotspot can produce a chain of trailing islands on which may flourish temporarily before the island sinks one by one back into the sea. And I really just like connected all of this to just like this idea of like a Puerto Rico without Puerto Ricans or like a land that is like in constant like shifting and moving and like under different like power dynamics where I mean, sometimes we're like not even sure who are the people making the decisions. And I mean, just like not given like the right to like make their own decisions like independence uh, as whole. Um, and then in a, during a, a protest in uh, San Juan, the Colectiva Feminista had um, this like giant, giant like painted banner that says, Construyamos Otra Vida, which meant, it means uh, let's build another life. And there's like a lot of ideas of world building and, and just like different like communities and like the art world, just kind of this like idea of like building new utopias where we like actually belong, but then also at the same time, like having to deal with like the non-utopic, like dystopic places that we live in. And um, also Sofia uh, Garisa's For Freedoms Building, which says, imagine, imaginemos la libertad, imagine freedom. And just kind of like allowing ourselves to also like use imagination, I think, through the process of everything that's happening and has happened, we tend to be like just so exhausted. And like, I want to believe in like the use of imagination. Um, uh, and then just like other things like uh, Brock Pierce trying to uh, build like a crypto Puerto Rico and then just like overtaking like a lot of parts of the islands. So obviously this is like a lot a lot, a lot, and, and just kind of like condensing all of this into like this one video has been so much. Um, and honestly, like I, I like, which where I say I'm like still not done. And also like my experience living in California and hearing people talk about like Hawaii and Mexico and like their ownership of Hawaii and Mexico and like crossing the border daily, like people just like crossing the border and like absolutely no respect for like Mexican people and like indigenous people and everything. I'm just kind of like, this is like a big, like a huge fear of mine for Puerto Rico. And then just like also kind of like self um, identifying that like I also live in occupied line and like sometimes I just like have to check myself, right? And we have to listen to other people. Um, and so here's some sources that have influenced this work and it's called um, Isla Flotante. This is the last uh, video that I will show you guys. Um, here, I'm going to do another. Last one. Other slides, but last video. Thank 
que tú visualizas. No voy a nada, porque estaba todo oscuro. Y con mi mano no buscaba donde yo pude aguantarme para evitar que me, que me fuera yo a perder el balance. Pero me fui poco a poco, tratando de arrastrándome poco a poco hasta que alcancé un arbolito. Y este arbolito me ayudó a yo estar segura que estaba en ese sitio, no en el agua. So, Floating Island really, I think, um, <clears throat> allows like my family to 
be kind of playful and not always like in this. I mean, obviously there are things that are happening that are just like questionable to like uh, just basic, uh, oh no, trying to connect. Um, just like basic forms of uh, uh, living and whatnot. And um, will we connect? Oh well. Um, and so like, it really is just kind of like allowing my family, like some like different generational like stories to be combined in a way where everything doesn't have to be so tragic and serious, even though day to day they might feel at some point that they are. And so like having, like I asked my grandmother like how she would picture herself in a floating island, just like for funsies. Um, and then she, her description was very connected to how she navigates the house when there's no power. And I thought that was really interesting and how like the visualization of the future is kind of based on like the experiences that we have. And basically as well, like they're like generational, like my, my cousin is in this, my grandma is in this, and there's so many different ages in them. And I really like working with like ab absolutely um, <clears throat> everyone. So I'll just, I'll just share it like this because I'm trying to connect. Um, and so I was a resident at Hidrante in Puerto Rico, which allowed me to work like really close to my family and not just like make all this video and later like process it. And then the work was showed as um, part of like the Apex art. And it was this uh, group exhibition called Be El Futuro Es Maravilloso Hay Puerto Ricanos. I saw a future, it's wonderful, there are Puerto Ricans. Um, where I also kind of just like worked with soil and different like house like decor things. I made like a silicone, um, <clears throat> sorry, I made uh, like silicone molds and just kind of kept using soil as part of my installation. And of course, through the act of making, life happens. And then within like the past two months, I lost my grandfather. And so I really just went from like having someone that was like an active storyteller in my work to just like not being there at all. I'm trying to kind of manage like, how do I keep working with these narratives when people are not there? Um, and so currently as part of Isla Flotante, there's um, of course a scene that is obstructed by a generator because there was no power of my grandfather talking to me and saying how how glad he he was like que bueno verte antes de morir like how good to see you before passing and i mean again not to like just kind of focus on these like tragic things but sort of just kind of like keep working on this film as a way that it feels connected to everyone in my family as a, through like weaving like everything that we are dealing through as like people but there are also like really happy moments where my nephew is like trying to figure out um, if this is a good egg or not which he does by putting it up into the sun and deciding if it's yellow enough um, and, and then just kind of like working with like my, my nibblings also allows for like a, a different type of energy through like everything that sometimes feels um, very heavy. Um, and that's it, we're done. Wow. I don't know what happened. Does anyone have any questions? Oh. Oh my God, sorry. I'll just go back to one of these scenes. Do you wanna, oh yeah, turn it on. I'll just go back. So we can have like a background image or something. Here, my uncle pretending to be a bird. Yes? Do you see your style as emerging to or growing into greater surrealism that would be braver with more harshly juxtaposed images? 
Installation wise, I think my work is very flexible and it can be seen in like many ways. I'm not attached to a particular style as all at all, but story narrative telling, I do feel like I'm leaning more towards like a speculative realm because it's like a place where I, I really don't have, I mean, I don't have a lot of control with my work because it's made you know, with my family, however they decide, I'm just like kind of there. Um, I don't set them up, I don't post them or anything, but I think um, just kind of like a more speculative realm allows for just, I don't know, just like more to play with. And I really like having that. Um, does that answer? Yes. Okay. Yes, person. Yeah, so still images and then I kind of a two part how yeah. would you what tips would you have for photographers who want to introduce video art into their practice but don't really know where to start? So I had made a single video and then I was asked to teach video and then I was like, Oh, I guess I have to learn video because I accepted and I was like, Yeah, I can do it. But I obviously I was a very basic like premiere pro user and I feel like once you like have to motivate yourself to teach other people, but I, I am like a really big fan of like video works. I just never thought that I would be good to do it, you know, like all of that self doubt and whatnot. And I was just kind of like, I don't know. Like I started with like some, um, uh, like the, like just putting a lot of images on the timeline and then just like zooming through and just being like, did it, made a video, but, um, I think also just collecting video helped me a lot because then I can just, I just have like an archive, you know, I have, um, at least like three hard drives full of video, some that I've never even looked at and I, I'm, it's a shame, but I, I will go through them and then just kind of like having that, just making it to make it not for the purpose of anything and, and just having it there. I was like, what's this? What can I do with this, you know? I'm not like a drawer or a sketcher. And so like a lot of my professors would be like, draw your idea. And I would just panic and just be like, how? And I like holding a pencil and like making like a, a head. I was like, I don't know, dude, this is weird. Um, and so like, I think collecting images, like really uh, or collecting video helped me like set scenes and, and grab screen grabs for like photos that I wanted to make. And then I was like, oh, I can just go with video. Does, is that yeah. help? What was your other question? Oh, like yeah. tips? Yeah, like, just um, make what stuff. Do you notice, like with your video art, like how does it fit within contemporary spaces today? And what might you consider if you wanted to get into making video art? Honestly, uh, well, well, first, I think my advice would be just to make it and have it because you could. It's better to have it and dispose it than to not have it and wish that you had it, right? And then like, I don't really know where my work fits because it really depends. I mean, I've had people that like put me on a show just so that they can have diversity, you know? And because they can like process the work. And then at the same time, I've had people that put me in an exhibition with like other amazing artists and I'm just like, how did I get here? Um, and I always ask, like, I've had a lot of studio visits where I'm like, why did you pick my work? Which is like a very basic question, but I wanna know like what they're looking at that I'm probably not seeing. And a lot of times they're just going like on a rant and I'm like, I don't know, okay, what, you know, whatever you're saying. And then sometimes, you know, that's really helpful. They're like, oh, like I recently had a studio visit with someone. I was like, why did you select my work? Because it's all like ceramics and, and, and like other like sculptural things. And I'm like, not that. Um, and then she was like, I really think that you have uh, a very like poignant way of like creating a narrative about passing. And I never even, I didn't really think about that, but I was like, oh, that's what other people are getting from my work. So good to write that down. And I have an extensive Google doc of like notes and whatnot, just to be like, oh yeah, that's there. Cause sometimes you work on something for so long, you just, you just like kind of don't feel it in the same way. Yes. Yes, person. Hi. Um, so I love your work. I love the way that you teach. Thank you. I was especially moved by your work with the layer of rock. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the soil or the, the oh, soil. yeah. I think it's a little bit of both, right? Because I'm working with my family. Um, like I said, like a lot of times I have like no control. I'm just like, oh my God, um, I really want to film over here. And they're like, well, we're over here doing this other thing. I'm like, well, this doesn't do much for me. But then I just keep collecting. But also like within these collaborations, um, there have been times where they send me work, they send me videos, they send me photographs. And then I make like little visual cues of like, I want to replicate that. Um, I like working with people that are not like, I guess like not, like my family's like not art trained, which I feel like makes it so great because I, I just feel like they like have no fear of the things that they make. There's no like, there's no criticism. They're just kind of like, yeah, show it to your friends, you know? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, and like, I think adopting that as well has like helped me because I, I, I think like trained as like a photo person, uh, there's like a lot of like edges, pristine, framing. Um, it was a very traditional, I was trained under like very traditional photographers and they're just so attached to it. But also like, I loved like, like Julia Margaret Cameron was like a bad photographer because she was sloppy. And I was like, that's my favorite. I want to be a sloppy maker. Like when I'm working with these, like my family, they're not, they don't care, you know? And so I was like, I have to like unlearn some things. And so like, it's good to know the rules, but also good to break them. And I just like aspire to not be good. at. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense, but it's just like, it's just, there's just like some realness to it in the work and like also I think that's why people are able to connect to it you know there's not like this wall like you have to be this sort of like trained in order to get it it's, it's very relatable does that is that okay person over here do you think leaving Puerto Rico is beneficial for your work you know that's a very complicated question because when I left Puerto Rico, I worked as a nanny, um, like a persona nanny, and I was trying to go to school for something else. So I don't really see leaving Puerto Rico as like beneficial, but I do think that there are just some personal benefits that I have that like maybe someone like my sister like doesn't have. I mean, so it's like, it's like very complicated. It's like a back and forth. And also, I was telling Bobby today, you know, when I started making work, I just made a lot of like gay portraits, you know, so it took me a really long time to kind of focus on something that I really, really cared about. And that's what helps me like engage with my work. Um, I was kind of just like fulfilling assignments, if, if, the, if that makes sense. And also when I made Remedio Casero, which was the first photo project, I was so, I was like upset because everyone was like, go back, photograph them in this way. And I'm like, this is my family, you know? So I don't think that it was beneficial, but I don't think that I was going to go to art school there. I was going to school for like sociology and criminology, which is, I was like, oh, what, why did I do that? Does that, is that, I don't know. Maybe some days I feel like it is, and maybe some days I feel like it's not, and I don't know. It's kind of like a, uh, uh, kind of thing. Yes? No, I really appreciate it, and you know, it seems like you capture the complexities, the layers uh, of the Puerto Rican experience in itself, but because uh, even I was looking, I don't know, if you show the, the photo of the, the plates and all sort of stuff, there's like an empty Sorry. or something like that. That is so Puerto Rican, right? Uh, of using those containers as, 
Uh, so, you know, so you have some aspect of culture, some aspect of place, and kind of like the question is, you know, is, is the driving factor family, is it place, is it culture, is it the complexity? It's, I think it might be all, it might be all it's just it. such a like, uh, like such a pot, you know, like you can't have one without the other. Like the reason why I'm attached to those, uh, uh, to that living room is because that's where I was raised. Like my parents, like we were talking Barceloneta, my dad worked for Pfizer. So he would travel like from Añasco to Barceloneta like two hours in the morning, maybe like two or three hours in the evening. So I really didn't see him that much. And my mom was working too. And so like my grandparents, like, like just a like culture of grandparents, right? And sort of like, there was like n no break in, it's almost like they were raising their own kids when they were raising us. And so I think it is all of it. But I also want to say that just because I'm like working with my family doesn't mean it's, it's not like rainbows and unicorns, you know? It's, I mean, behind the photographs, there are a lot of really hard conversations about like queerness and like what I'm doing, why I don't move back to Puerto Rico, like, um, you know, all of the jobs that I have, why can I just get like one job? You know, there's just like a lot of things that are happening in the background that sometimes I feel like the tension is there and sometimes I feel like it's not. So it's like the culture, the house, the family, this sort of like uh, restfulness of just being with people that will hug you and feed you and love you. And then at the same time being angry with them because like, they're scared of saying the word gay or whatnot, you know? And like having difficult conversations with like a generation that just like is very set on their ways. Um, so it's just like sometimes really, really hard. And I'm like, I'm done. I'm gonna make work about like trees or something. And, and, and somehow it's something always just kind of, the, the recordings just continue to be there. But there's also a lot of times where like we don't make anything. Like I didn't make anything for when I was, um, at my grandfather's funeral because that was just like so, such a, like a raw moment and I've had critiques where they're like well why not and I'm like because my family are people you know and so like they should be able to have their lives as people and so there's like a lot of it like in it does, does that answer you okay yes For yeah. Your entire practice, I just want to like hear you talk about that more. I don't even have a specific question, but yeah. is, that, is that yeah, definitely kind of like, a, like a guiding sort of framework or something for like how yeah, it's like. El vaivén, which is called, is like the come and go, and it's just like the constant shifting between. Um, like Boricuas, Puerto Ricans are here and in the US and Puerto Rico and just kind of like that like back and forth that is seen within that group mostly because of citizenship and, um, and sort of just kind of like this like, sometimes I feel like the only empty quiet space that I have is like the plane. I'm like, oh my God, okay, here. But also, um, that when I was a child, I should, I should have said this, like when I was a child, like uh, I was scared that the island was moving for some reason because I was like, what is it attached to? And because I didn't really understand, you know? And so my dad was like, I think it moves. And so that's the beginning of the narrative. And then my nephew picking up the rock, he was like, is this loose? And it just kind of like opened up like all of this stuff that I feel like I was holding in and it's yeah like it's a metaphor kind of like of the status of the island I think it's a metaphor for like a lot of Boricuas and Puerto Ricans that are kind of constantly like shifting like in shift mode um and I think it's like part of my practice and I just it's not until now that I've had like a full view I'm like oh it takes time like I thought I was only making work about this one thing and then when you take more time with it you're like oh it's about like this like greater thing. And then I do constantly feel like I'm in like one of those like, like sphere balls where people like hamster wheel inside. I feel like that's me many, many times. And I have like separate lives. I have like a life, 
like a very set like life there. Like I see people from high school that call me like by like my family name was a Jesse, um, you know. And then um, like a completely different life here. And there's sometimes there's not a lot of melting in between, which I feel is also what keeps the back and forth and the shifting, and just kind of like the floatingness, like a, a sense of a sensory deprivation tank but life, yes. Yeah, does that, does that answer? Okay. Yes. So I'm very interested in how you collaborate with your family. It's definitely a part of your work. And I think it's unique that you make abundance of time is the right word, but you have a lot of time with them, a comfortability with them. How do you think that may affect your work collaborating with someone that isn't your family? Like how did you grow up? Yeah, so I, um, collaborating with my family sometimes feels like very genuine. Like last night I was at my uncle's house and we were like just like having a conversation. And he was like, did I ever, did you ever know the story about why your grandpa didn't get on a plane? And I was like, no. And then starts to tell me the story about uh, why my grandpa didn't fly. But I also think like for me, it's very attached to like my other grandparents and like different people as like they're kind of like, tightness to stay in the island and like um my generation my parents generation of more like back and forth mobile generation you know and so that's where like my wheels start turning and I'm like oh my god like okay tell me more and I told him that I wanted to record it and he was like I'm nervous now um which I thought was like really cute but like that's like a form of collecting just through like telling stories and I feel very lucky to have a people in my family that are just like open to that because honestly without it I probably wouldn't have work but I've also collaborated um with like other people as in like collecting like their own experiences like I did a residency at the um Illinois State University um for like two for like three or four weeks I think and I worked with the students they're just like asking them questions about like, what do you know about the island? And what do you know about this? And like, what is your sense of safety? And then just having those conversations and they were really open to it. And then like, we were very different. I was like, well, thank you. And they're like, oh, I don't think this will help you. I'm like, actually, this helps me a lot because I don't have this experience. And I'm, you know, I'm, I know people are not afforded this experience. Like we were talking about sort of like, um, what would happen if there were an earthquake or what would happen if this, if, if there were a hurricane? And they're like, no. Like, I never have that fear. And I'm like, wow. But they do have a fear of, like, tornadoes, you know? But they don't have a fear of, like, um, just, like, an, a, catas a natural catastrophe happening where, like, they're not taken care of and, like, the a government doesn't act and, like, all of those things. And I'm like, did you remember Katrina, you know? But also that plays into, like, environmental race, uh, racism and just, like, the, uh, who do we take care of and, like, who's important and who's not. And, like, those conversations, I felt, like, were really valuable because I'm, like, you guys are the ones forming art next. And if you don't have any fears, like, what's going to come out of the work that you make, you know? Um, so there, there are different ways that I collaborate, but I... I don't know. There's, there's just, I have recordings. I just told them, uh, you know, they, they like, I was like, if this is ever used, you know, I'll have you sign something. <laughs> Does that, yes. okay. All right, all right. Anyone else? We're good? I think we're good. Yay, thank, thank you. you.